Welcome to Coronavirus, What You Need to Know. This is our seventh live town hall program in the series. These programs are produced in association with the Sonoma County Department of Emergency Services, with input from public health agencies around the Bay Area and many nonprofit organizations. Good evening, I'm Darren Lachelle, President and CEO of Northern California Public Media. And I'm Mattia White, Assistant News Director of Northern California Public Media. Coming up, we'll hear from Congressman Jared Huffman and Mike Thompson. They talk about how well the federal government's response is meeting the overwhelming needs in our county. We'll learn about the City of Santa Rosa Fire Department's new pandemic response team. And we'll talk with the County Public Health Officer, Dr. Sundry Mace, and Supervisor James Gore, who will be answering your questions. Darren Lachelle has the details on how you can submit your questions to the newsroom. It's easy to submit your questions. Before we get to that, just a quick note for some of our viewers. Um, during tonight's program, the entire staff and crew here at NorCal Public Media are wearing masks and gloves and um, are adhering to safety standards. Here on the set of the television program, we are socially distanced appropriately for safety. So I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that tonight. These town hall programs give you the opportunity to ask public officials and elected leaders the questions that are on your mind. You do that by visiting the easy to con use contact form on our website. It's at norcalpublicmedia.org slash coronavirus. If you have a question about the coronavirus, go to norcalpublicmedia.org slash coronavirus. There you will find our new question submission form. If you want to ask a question, please include your name, email address, select a subject, and write your question in the box above. You can sign up for our coronavirus newsletter or opt to not have your name published with your question. Then click Submit. We will be in touch if we use your question on our weekly coronavirus town hall program. The new question submission form will be on all of NorCal Public Media's web pages related to the coronavirus. We will no longer be using viewer at norcalpublicmedia.org as a way for viewers to submit questions. Please use our new question form to ask any questions you may have about the coronavirus. Thank you. And thank you so much to many of you who've already used our new plat platform to submit questions. Again, you can do so at norcalpublicmedia.org slash coronavirus. Next up, Los Cien, Sonoma County hosted a virtual coronavirus town hall on Friday with Northern California representatives Mike Thompson and Jared Huffman. The panel was moderated by Santa Rosa attorney Oscar Pardo. In this excerpt from that town hall, Thompson and Huffman outlined some of the economic and health challenges facing the region and the federal programs to address them. Moving forward, uh, as we're thinking about that, I sort of see this recovery at the next phase uh, kind of in a two-headed threat. There's the healthcare threat about how to manage uh, soft openings uh, going forward and all the healthcare provisions or uh, markers that you need to have in place. And then there's the continued economic threat about how do you get the economy going back again. I'm going to start back with uh, Congressman uh, Huffman on the uh, public health uh, side yeah. and, and fill us in on what Congress would be looking at uh, as they hopefully come back into session soon. Yeah, and, and as vexing and complicated as this issue seems, um, all of it comes down right now to two critical bottlenecks, testing and protective equipment. Uh, and it's, it's real interesting to talk about, you know, the kind of metrics you'd want to see so you could begin to identify certain sectors, certain employees, and you can begin to reopen the economy and start with small group things and eventually move up to larger gatherings. That's all very interesting, but you can't do any of it. Uh, you can't have hospitals resume elective surgeries. You can't have uh, the tourist economy open back up in, in the coast of Sonoma County and Mendocino County unless you have the ability to do in, in places where you've been able to contain it, to do surveillance testing and to have the stockpiles of testing to deal with any outbreaks. 
uh, and then to have the uh, stockpile of protective equipment to deal with any surge to the healthcare system. Without those two things, this is all just talk. Uh, and the challenge here is that even two months into this crisis, we still don't have a national plan on testing. There's still not a single person in charge at the federal government of a national testing strategy. You've got Dr. Bricks that talks to some labs. You've got Jared Kushner that talks to private sector entities. No one is really in charge and they still won't invoke the Defense Production Act to just grab manufacturing capacity and give us the tests we need. Same really goes for the personal protective equipment. So um, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but it is the it really is the answer to all of these things. We've got to get a handle on testing and protective equipment in order to get to all the other things that we all desperately want to do. And Mike and I have been frustrated at the federal level because you have this powerful authority that this administration just won't exercise. And in the absence of that, the states, the county public health officials and individual hospitals and clinics are all fending for themselves in this wild helter-skelter competition with everyone else in the world who's also trying to get these kind of components at the same time. That's just not working. One of the questions that was posed is whether there would be any funding to uh, strengthen or, or further the uh, broadband uh, access, uh, given that now everything is online, or for the most part. So I'll, I'll take a first shot at that if I could. Um, so there was uh, a, a very initial step toward providing some of those resources, not nearly enough. But um, look, this, this crisis really has brought to the into sharp focus some of the disparities in this country and social justice gaps. Uh, and you know, part of that is the, the health app outcomes that very desperately hit communities of color because of uh, pre-existing health problems. Uh, but part of it is this learning gap. And you know, when we tell everyone you're gonna do distance learning for the rest of this year and maybe part of next year, it's, it is exciting to see how that works in areas that have broadband. There's some really great innovation going on and, and uh, it's, it's a plausible workaround. For uh, a lot of the communities I represent, for example, the heavily Latino community in the canal in San Rafael, or if you wanna go out to the coast of Sonoma or any part of coastal Mendocino County, it just doesn't work. Uh, you don't have the kind of connectivity and the, the limited resources we've made available don't even begin to come close to what will be needed. So sometime in the next few uh, legislative responses, I think Mike and I would love to get to a big, bold um, infrastructure initiative. And we wanna make sure that it includes broadband. This can be the crisis that finally closes that broadband gap, which is gonna be a good thing, not just for distance learning, uh, but it's going to be a good thing for telemedicine and for rural economic development and just basic needs of life in the 21st century for all of these communities who deserve better. And uh, Congressman Thompson, on the same topic of, of schools and funding and, and so forth, would, would there be any consideration or discussion uh, in the next session or act to come about providing additional funding for these local agencies uh, like school districts to continue their programming? Well, um, look at it this way. Look at the three bills that we've already passed as, um, as stopping the bleeding. Uh, so the, you know, the, the big bill, and a lot of people called it a stimulus bill, the uh, COVID-3, it was, it was a stop the bleeding bill. And, um, and COVID-4 is going to be stop the bleeding too. Um, and then, but after that, that's when we're going to focus on stimulus, things to get the economy going again, bring, uh, bring jobs back, and to address some of these uh, tremendous needs that we have. And, and Jared pointed this out with, with broadband. Uh, how, how can you do distance learning when there at a certain distance, you, you have no access to uh, the technology that brings you this, the learning part of that. Uh, so 
uh, broadband expansion is certainly part of it. Uh, our investments in, uh, in healthcare facilities, we know for a fact that some healthcare facilities uh, are just inadequate, even in, in good times. And the healthcare facilities are what's really keeping us going right now. So we're gonna have to invest uh, in, in those as well. Coming up in the program, we're going to be speaking with Sundry Mace, who is the public health officer for Sonoma County. So if you have questions for her to answer here live tonight, make sure that you get those to us on our website, norcalpublicmedia.org, or through social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at norcalpublicmedia. Now, last week, the Santa Rosa Fire Department launched its new pandemic response unit. The team is equipped with the personal protective equipment needed to respond to emergency calls related to COVID. 19, and it is one of the first of its kind in California. Assistant News Director Adia White spoke with Deputy Fire Chief Scott Westrope about how the response unit works in practice. Uh, this is a two-person squad, so um, it's two of our personnel, one is a paramedic and one is an EMT, and uh, they respond primarily to flu-related calls or pandemic-related calls. So um, this is in addition to the engine or truck that normally goes to a medical aid with an ambulance. Um, but this squad is set up with uh, specialized equipment to enter into a facility or into a home that somebody may have COVID or know they have COVID. Um, and then more, more importantly, probably is when they leave the home or when a crew leaves the home or facility, they have the ability to decontaminate the entire crew, whether it be the engine crew, truck crew, ambulance crew, or themselves prior to going back in service. So the whole point is try to reduce spread of uh, the coronavirus or, you know, or really any other communicable disease throughout our workforce. And by, by doing so, we're protecting the community better by keeping ourselves healthy. And this is one of the first pandemic response units to launch in the state. How has it been working out so far? So yeah, a lot of fire departments throughout the state and throughout the country are doing a lot of things to, um, to serve their community better, you know, and, and working within the confines of what our budget and resources are. Uh, we felt that this was the, uh, the best swipe at how we can best serve the community. Um, we obviously don't have the ability for a mobile health clinic or um, or fire department testing for COVID-19, uh, but it's been working out very well. The first 48 hours that they were on duty is what they work in a shift. As they work 48 hours, they ran 27 calls for service. Um, they didn't make it to the scene every time. They made it to the scene 14 times in the first 48 hours, uh, but we're definitely feeling an impact within the organization, within the city, and um, it, it's serving its purpose very well by keeping our employees safe and they, they can continue to serve the community. And how does the squad help to keep both potential patients as well as the crew safer? So the PRU or the squad has um, the highest level of personal protective equipment available to us in the field right now. So um, it's not something we can provide to all of our crews. All of our crews, um, the engines and the trucks have pretty much the medium level PPE. So they have uh, gowns, booties, face masks, and um, obviously gloves. What the squad has that's different is they actually have what you would see us wearing when we go into a hazardous materials environment. So a fully encapsulated suit, uh, rubber boots that go up to the knees, they tape all the enclosure shut. Um, they can actually wear their self-contained breathing apparatus uh, face mask, but instead of hooked to our air tank, it's actually hooked to a P100 filter cartridge. So they're completely encapsulated. And so they're, they're keeping the contaminants from getting in and infecting, infecting anybody else. But like I said, also when they leave the home or the facility or an enclosed space, uh, they actually go out and they will decontaminate themselves before they take anything off. And then they'll also decontaminate anybody that was in contact with the patient with the theory being then, then the contaminants don't get spread into the apparatus, which then they don't get taken back to the station. And that way we don't you know, somehow wipe out an entire crew or a large part of our workforce uh, by spreading something back from a home into our, one of our fire stations. And you did have one employee test positive so far for COVID-19. Um, any, has anyone else in the department been, been shown to have it so far? No, the one employee that we had test positive for COVID-19, it was travel related. So the employee, fortunately, uh, we had quarantine rules in place, did not return back to work, actually lives outside the city limits, and so never returned to the city limits and never contacted any other employees. So we were very fortunate. Uh, this employee had uh, very minor symptoms and is recovered and back to work. Um, we have been very fortunate that we have not had any other COVID-19 um, employees 
And so we're just trying to keep it that way by putting these, uh, these principles into effect. Well, I'm happy to hear that they've recovered. That's good news. It is good news. Um, what is the department's current policy about CPR and other um, very close contact medical procedures at this time? Sure. So every patient requires a little bit different type of care or different type of contact. And really, our standard of care has not changed. We're not uh, changing any of the medical protocols developed by the, the county. Uh, we're still working with all of our partners. It's just how we approach those calls. So if it is a, if it is a call where it's CPR or if it's a call where um, somehow the, the uh, bodily fluids become aerosolized, so we give them a breathing treatment or um, CPAP, things like that, um, our crews are going in in full PPE. So there's no delay in care. There's no change in the standard of care. It's just how we approach it differently and how we're dressing for that. So um, there could be an instance where it comes in as a cardiac arrest and maybe the, the patient has flu-like symptoms ahead of time. The engine or truck will arrive first with the ambulance and um, suit up and everything that they have. The squad will come in behind them and, and help them with that patient care. But the catalyst different now is they will be decontaminated much differently than they would have in the past. So we've had a number of viewer questions come in from the audience over the past few weeks. And the one that we keep getting frequently is about fire season. People are concerned that if there's a, a large evacuation during fire season and we still have the pandemic happening, that that could be dangerous. Has the fire department discussed what this kind of scenario would look like? And can you elaborate on what kind of policies you might consider in that case? Yeah, absolutely. It's something that's on the forefront of our mind is, um, you know, we're still in springtime, but we know it's coming. Um, there's certainly some predictions that this uh, this quarantine or shelter in place order or the coronavirus in general could extend through the summer months. So it's something that uh, we're starting to talk about now. Um, we have been talking for about it for about a month. Um, I can't speak to any specific policy that we have nailed down yet, but we are currently talking about it amongst our command staff and amongst Sonoma County Fire Chiefs and with our partners at Cal Fire and how we're going to approach fire season. Um, we're working on messaging to get out to the public about, hey, now's a great time if you can maintain social distancing and follow county and CDC guidelines to get out and do your weed abatement, get out and do your vegetation management. Um, we're continuing the city weed abatement uh, program through our vendor. Um, while maintaining social distancing and the masking policy and things like that. So as long as we're following the rules, we're trying to prepare for fire season like we normally would. It just, it kind of slows it down and complicates it, obviously, if we're still under quarantine or shelter in place um, order. So uh, we are tackling that task. It's going to be monumental and, and it is going to be across the state of California. We're going to have to do things much differently than we did in previous years. Please share your questions with us so that we can get answers for you during these live town hall programs. Visit our easy to use contact form on our website, norcalpublicmedia.org slash coronavirus. Fill in your question, share your name and email, and select the subject of your question and then click submit. And we'll get your question in right away to one of these live town hall programs each Tuesday night at seven o'clock. Now the program is being translated in Spanish live right now on La Mejor Radio 104. 4.1 FM. We thank La Mejor Radio for their partnership on these town hall programs and for the great service that they provide to our community. And now, Adia, back to you. Thanks, Darren. We're joined now by Sonoma County Health Officer Dr. Sundri Mace, who will be answering some of your questions. Thank you so much for joining us again. Great. Thanks to have me. As usual, I'm going to start with our update in terms of numbers of cases. Um, I wanted to let people know that we've added 10 new uh, cases today. And that's to be expected because on Mondays and Tuesdays, we start with our aggressive uh, contact tracing, meaning that we're testing people who are contacts of cases. So we've added 10. That brings us to 103 active cases, 87 that are recovered. We still have the two deaths that we've reported. And uh, we probably have performed about 4,600, 700 tests at this, at this time. And I wanted to just uh, note that, as I said, we have more cases in the contacts. So now over 50% of our cases are occurring in people that we've identified as contacts and we're reaching out and testing them ourselves in public health. Our community transmission cases have dropped to 19%. And uh, as I had mentioned before, the majority of our cases are occurring in 18 to 49 year olds, probably because those are the people who are going out into the community right now for essential business and, and uh, essential activities. And then if you look at the distribution in terms of the uh, region, uh, the vast majority, 108 cases now, are in the central county. 
So and as we'd expect in the urban centers. And those would be cumulative cases, right? You're not cumulative. tracking the tracking Cumulative cases, cases, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have some exciting news that you're about to announce about our testing capacity, I heard today right. during the press conference. Um, so tell us a little bit more about that. What is this increased testing capacity that we should be seeing? Right, so we have, I, I think I told people that we had actively gone out and sought the swabs that um, we had a shortage of to try to get them for our county, and we were able to purchase the initial 5,000 swabs, which allows us now to test much more widely. And we're expecting another 5,000 from the same Amazon source to be coming in. And then we also have an order in for about 100,000 more that should be coming to us in the next couple of weeks. So um, as a result of that, we can start doing much more widespread testing like we always been planning to do. Now, um, the CDPH and CD CDC released some new priority categories for who should be tested, and we're going to follow that. So basically, priority one are hospitalized patients, but they're not going to be part of our outpatient testing, clearly. So symptomatic health care workers are the first group that we're going to actively seek uh, for testing. And then we're going to also be testing asymptomatic health care workers next. So those are the groups I think initially we're planning on for this weekend. And uh, after that, we'll be testing symptomatic first responders, that'd be law enforcement, firefighters. Um, and then we'll be looking at um, symptomatic persons in essential infrastructure occupations. And that would be like utility workers, food supply workers, uh, people who are working in the court system, other public, public employees. And then lastly, and I think we'll be there soon, we're gonna do community-based testing for all people who are symptomatic. And I'm hoping we'll be there soon. So the process will be um, given to people tomorrow. We'll be very clear in putting out our message of how people can call to get an appointment to be tested. We'll put the phone numbers out. We'll have live bodies on the other end answering people and giving them appointments if they meet the priority status. So this Saturday and Sunday, we'll perform testing of probably about 200 persons each, and then we'll continue. We're not stopping until we've gotten through all of our people that we need to be tested. And again, once you are able to test general community members, does this mean anyone who feels they should get a test will be able to, or what do you have to demonstrate once you do get to that stage? Right, so you know, I think if anybody is concerned that they have symptoms consistent with COVID, and um, it could be anything, the fever, cough, shortness of breath, sore throat, even the GI symptoms that we've talked about. We're going to be fairly loose with what we consider could be symptoms for COVID. So yes, then people would call in when their priority um, of testing comes up. So again, this weekend, uh, we're only going to be calling out the services for healthcare workers, both symptomatic ones that potentially never got tested or if they got tested and they're still symptomatic, or uh, asymptomatic healthcare workers would be next in line. Um, and they're already, again, a priority for, for testing, though. Exactly, but we're gonna do it ourselves now, so it's gonna be much more widespread, I think. Right, so does that mean if they're a resident of another county, but they work here in Sonoma County, would that apply to those first responders as well? Yeah, I think so. You know, If they're able to identify that they do work in a healthcare facility in Sonoma County, I think that should be fine. And you said that this might happen soon for the general community. How, how soon do you see that happening? Are you talking about a matter of maybe a, a month or a few weeks? No, I think it'd be sooner than a month because, you know, we're going to go through the priority categories, and that would be the healthcare workers, first responders, and other sort of public uh, essential employees that are out there. And I don't see there being huge numbers uh, um, of those persons. We'll have to see. If we can do 200 tests a day, then you can see that maybe in a couple of weeks we'll be able to start testing uh, community members that are symptomatic. And what does this news mean for our shelter in place order? Does this kind of help us reach a criteria that we might eventually meet when we start looking at lifting that order? Can you put that well, in context? Then? Yeah, it's one of the priority areas, one of the criteria for moving towards shelter in place. So it's really important that we get out there and try to test as many of the symptomatic people as possible. I think once we have aggressive testing, which is what this strategy is, once it's in place, then we've met that criteria to move towards uh, loosening up shelter in place. 
And so I want to jump into the viewer questions here because I think my next few questions will align with theirs as well. Um, can you tell us more about the antibody test? So people are very curious about, first of all, um, what it is exactly. We'll start there. Right. So, so far, there's only three FDA-approved antibody tests. Others are on their way. Now, there's a lot of tests out there that are not FDA-approved that we are not um, going to suggest that people, recommend that people get. So we've put out a request to get one particular FDA-approved test, and hopefully we'll be having that test sometime in the next couple of weeks. Now, what that is, is it's a test, it's a blood test that looks for immunity, meaning have you ever been infected with COVID? It's not that good for telling, are you now infected with COVID? For that, we would still rely on the swab testing and the virus testing. But the antibody, if we were to test, let's say, all first responders, we could find out how many of them were ever infected with the virus. So you already answered the first few questions here, which was whether or not it meant that they had been exposed or whether they had it currently. So that's good to know. Right. It's just that the, the test isn't really meant right now for detecting those who currently have infection. And it's not as good as a, the genetic test that we're using uh, in the lab now for detecting current infection. And I also read that there might be a gap in time, too, between when you had the virus and when you would start to develop what would test positive in the antibody test. Can you speak exactly. to that a little bit? Yeah, there's always a delayed response for immunity. So it takes time for people to build up antibodies. So that's why if you test really soon after a person's actually infected, it could be false negative, too. Right. So this next question is, um, so whether or not these tests are completely reliable, they seem to indicate in other places that many more people have been exposed than we previously thought. So how would that impact our strategies with dealing with the pandemic? And do you expect mm -hmm. to see that here? Well, I think we're already assuming that there's a certain percentage of uh, people that we're not detecting that are out in the community. But with the surveillance with the antibody test, like Santa Clara County just did, they found that about somewhere around 2.5 to 4.5 percent of the population was actually infected, which is about 50 times more than the number of cases that they're having. Here, given that we have a lower number of cases, we expect it to be less, so maybe it's more like 1%. So we'd have to find out by doing the antibody testing. Right, and then you would have to reassess a number of policies, I presume, once we get those results back? Yeah, I mean, I think we're already assuming that there's a lot more people that may have gotten infected that aren't positive mm -hmm. because we haven't tested them. Right. Um, so you already answered whether our test would be FDA approved, which mm -hmm. I understood was yes, ours would, Definitely. but they are not yeah. all. Um, so will it simply show up as a positive or negative, or is there a range that it might come back with? The serology test? Yeah. It gives you an idea of IgG antibodies or IgM antibodies, and I'm not sure whether it's quantitative or qualitative. So good question. We'll have to yeah, look Yeah, we can look, at, we look, can into, look into that and get back to you. Right. Um, so moving on to kind of the next topic out of antibodies, unless there's anything else that you think people should know about those tests before we move on. Um, just again, that we are going to be using it for surveillance. So it wouldn't be a test that we're using because we think that you're infected, but we may decide to screen, for example, amongst certain businesses, uh, you know, that sort of thing, to see who might have gotten infected over time or in skilled nursing facilities, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, so we've been told on the national level that the coronavirus is disproportionately affecting communities of color. Do we have that demographic breakdown for our county? Um, you know, we're collecting it. Thanks for asking that question. The race ethnicity question wasn't initially in the form, but now we've added it. And I think CDC and CDPH have recommended that we add it. And in fact, we're going back and we're going to call um, our cases to see how they're doing anyhow after the fact. So then we'll be able to ask that question of them as well. And how soon do you anticipate we might be able to start seeing that in, on the um, dashboard? I'm hoping within the next week or two we'll have all that data and we'll put it on the dashboard. Okay, so this next question is from someone who says that they work for a grocery store in Santa Rosa, and this store is not enforcing the order that customers wear face masks, but they are enforcing the order that employees wear face masks. Mm -hmm. So the exact question is, who do we go to to mm -hmm. report this problem? We witness other stores taking this seriously, while our store is not, and I feel like my life is in danger. Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, as you know, the uh, facial covering order does require that businesses, employers that is, ensure that their employees have facial coverings, either by providing them 
who are allowing employees to bring their own. Um, and we do have uh, also an order for people when they go into facilities like st stores to wear the facial coverings. So I think that if you're noting that that's not happening, it's worth making a call to uh, find, to maybe, uh, you know, you can certainly call your law enforcement or public health. You can call us and say, wow, we've seen this issue at this particular place, and we can uh, notify the law enforcement to go out and check it out. Is that the store's responsibility or people who enter the store? You know, I think the store could do that as well. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, maybe it would be better if the store were the ones to be the notifiers, but it could be anybody. And it's not going to be anything punitive. I think it's just making sure that law enforcement goes out and checks out the situation and recommends that people start wearing them. Because I, I think we need to get the message out in the community still. Um, so this next question is kind of a, a follow-up to this from someone else. And it kind of pertains to whether or not public health would ever step in and have stricter requirements in grocery stores. So why not require wipes available at checkout counters mm -hmm. for signing credit card transactions and touching pads, or suspend required signing altogether, which would be difficult in your power. But um, as far as requiring wipes at checkout counters, is that something that public health can do to require grocery stores to start carrying these items and you know, enforcing these orders more proactively among customers? Yeah, you know, the few places I've actually gone to have had those kinds of things in place, but uh, certainly it could be something that could be added to the guidance or the order. Um, so the next question is, if a person quarantines for 14 days and then returns to a home with another person, is it still possible to transmit the virus? So in other words, how confident are we that the 14-day quarantine period mm -hmm. is, is safe? Well, you know, it's a novel coronavirus, so we're learning um, uh, exactly how it's how effective it is at transmitting and also how long people could be infectious for. So the 14 days is a guidance that's been put out based on the data that we have, but it may not be 100% accurate. All right, that's an answer for a lot of these questions, right? It's a novel coronavirus. Exactly. So again, there's a lot that we still don't know about this. Um, so we've heard that some staff at local nursing homes have tested positive. Is there a list of nursing home and long-term care, care facilities that have instances of COVID-19 in residents or employees? Yeah, we don't have such a list. And I'm very happy to say that in the couple of instances, we have proactively gone in and done surveillance, and that's how we picked up COVID. And um, as a result, it appears that there's been no transmission. We've done widespread contact investigation and testing around any situations in these uh, congregate settings, and we haven't found any transmission so far. And can you explain what you mean by transmission? I, in other words, we haven't found any other people right. who have COVID that were infected by a person in a congregate setting. We haven't seen it being transmitted in those settings. Right, so we might have seen people, employees test positive, but no evidence that they're spreading it. Exactly, Right. that's Perfect. Mm -hmm. um, and so why won't the county release the information, the names of the nursing homes where we've seen an employee test positive? Well, it won't really change what we're doing. We're still going to require that healthcare workers and staff at these settings wear isolation masks if it's a patient care setting and wear facial coverings or isolation masks if it's any other congregate setting. And at this point, we have so few situations like this that it would be very easy then to track down individuals and we don't release any individual patient level data. And I think this is also a good jumping off point to talk a little bit about the order. Um, so you're now requiring that nursing home staff wear facial coverings, that uh, they're sur surveyed for possibly having COVID upon entering the right. facility. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Right, so for patient care facilities, that would include all hospitals, urgent care clinics, and skilled nursing facilities we are uh, mandating that isolation masks, that's a little step up from a facial covering, it's a commercial mask, be worn by the staff, any staff, healthcare worker or not. Now for other congregate settings, that would include residential care facilities, um, assisted living facilities, um, potentially juvenile hall, um, jails. We are recommending the same kind of mask, but if they can't get them, they can wear facial coverings. We just want to try to really limit transmission in all these settings with vulnerable populations. So does that apply to all of the instances that you just mentioned? If they can't get the personal protective equipment needed, then the facial coverings will suffice for that order? Not for patient care institutions, okay. but for non-patient care settings like board and care homes, mm -hmm. for example, 
Um, we would like for them to try to have access to isolation masks, and we're going to try to get enough to provide them. But in the event that they don't have them yet, then they can wear the facial coverings. So you are working with them to try to provide this yeah. equipment. Um, yeah, can you definitely. talk a little bit about that process? Well, we're putting uh, large orders for procurement for all different types of these masks. Mm -hmm. So whether it be the N95 respirators that healthcare workers are using to protect themselves, isolation um, masks that we've recommended for these other settings, the gloves, the gowns, the goggles, face shields, all these things we have orders in for, and we're getting them now at a greater rate than we were, say, two or three weeks ago. Well, that's good news that we're, yeah. we're getting them in. Definitely the getting rate. them. Mm -hmm. um, are we getting them to the level that we need them, or is there still a shortage? Uh, not yet, because like yeah. I said, I would like to have everybody in all congregate facilities be able to have the isolation masks, and that's what, definitely what our goal is. Right. And we did get a number of questions, although I didn't write them down, but are, I'm assuming that hospital workers are required to wear medical masks while treating patients. Isolation masks Iso when they're treating patients, all kinds of patients. Mm -hmm. But if they are worried that they have a patient that has COVID or somebody who they think could have COVID, then they wear the N95 masks to protect themselves and the gloves and the gown and the face shield. So jumping into some shelter in place questions, because we only have a few more minutes left here with you. If we're all sheltering in place as we have been, and the curve appears largely flat, why is it expected that we will have a surge of so many people? Why will we have a surge? Yeah, so in other words, we've been sheltering in place. We've been seeing that we're not mm -hmm. having as many hospitalizations as the modeling right. anticipated. So why are we still expecting that we'll see the surge? Is, it, is the modeling accurate, I think, is what right. this question is getting right. at. So, so let me just... Um, say some things that will make this really clear. So the modeling didn't think shelter in place would be this effective at re reducing community transmission. That's why we're seeing such a better flattening of the curve than anybody ever imagined shelter in place would lead, lead to. Now, as we start relaxing the shelter in place, that's when we're concerned that we'll see a resurgent number of cases or a surge. Because obviously, if shelter in place was that effective in flattening the curve, then taking it away is going to have the opposite effect. Right. So this is our last question. We have one more minute here. Do we know how many in the county are symptomatic but have not been tested? We don't, and that's why going out and testing is going to give us a much better idea of just that answer. All right. Um, well, maybe we have time for one more. I see we'll, we'll sneak one in here. Um, so let's see. So the last question is on the active number of hospitalizations in the county. So right now you're reporting how many people have been hospitalized over time, mm -hmm. and the state's reporting data on how many people we currently have hospitalized in the county. Um, can you tell us whether or not you'll begin reporting those numbers? So according to the state of California, Department of Public Health, we have two people who are currently hospitalized versus over time we've had, I believe it's 21 now. Right. Will we start reporting that number out of Sonoma County? I think if we had more, uh, persons, then we might go that route to be able to report. But with such low numbers, uh, we're not commenting on that right now. Okay. Um, do you have anything else that you'd like to add before we wrap up here? Just thanking everybody out there for um, sheltering in place and observing our orders and helping us flatten the curve. Thank you so much. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to having you again on next week. Um, thank you. All right, so next up, News Director Steve Mincher speaks with Supervisor James Gore. Um, he asked Gore some questions on everyone's mind, from when parks might reopen to how businesses can get back online. Gore is also fluent in Spanish and often has taken the lead in the county's outreach to the Spanish-speaking community, and News Director Steve Mincher spoke with him. All right, hello, James Gore, and uh, thank you very much for joining me. Thanks for having me. All right, James, there have been uh, several questions that have come in, but before we get to the questions, I know you've been taking part in the KBBF town halls in Spanish that usually are at 5 p.m. on Tuesdays, and I want to get a sense from you about how you would grade the county in terms of its communication with our uh, Spanish-speaking neighbors. I never give us above uh, an A- minus at best because we can always do better. And I, and I mean that honestly. Uh, the real reason that we organized the, uh, the effort on the Latino outreach, Latinx community outreach was because there was some concern, just like there have been in last uh, uh, disasters that we've gone through, that we were a little bit behind the bar. And so I want to applaud the more than 50 to 60 community leaders that have joined me on 
not just KBBF town halls, but weekly calls where we are getting ground truth, connecting it with policy, and then on the third side, just filling gaps where needed. So we've been able to uh, rapidly get out about a $25,000, $30,000 program on public service announcements through Spanish radio. Uh, we've been able to organize and deploy all of these, or, uh, all of this network of Latino support organizations, primarily Spanish speaking, to be able to uh, do what they need to do and to be able to figure out where the areas are in the county. We've upped our game in terms of translation, which was desperately needed. We don't just need bilingual employees translating what they think it says. We need professional translations for this degree of medical advice and uh, dictation. And, um, and then also we've been strong in the advocacy side and really uh, had a big win uh, recently uh, with the governor of California announcing support for undocumented individuals who live and reside in our community. And if they're, if they're in a hardship, then we're in a hardship. Okay, now let me start with some of the questions that have been coming in, and perhaps you can help us with some of these. Uh, when will we be able to visit between three family households? My family has folks between age 13 and 94 without social distancing. Uh, I think that that should be coming up if we open up the country in terms of the federal guidelines, when are you thinking the county will be able to open up so I can visit the rest of my family who doesn't live with me? Well, I think there's two ways to look at this. Number one is, is that we're under a state order as well. And so the county's shelter in place order, while it came before the state, and I think that was a good move on our part, um, I'm, I, I really wanna make sure that we're smart and we don't extend it longer than the state order unless there are valid reasons based on the epidemiology in our community and the healthcare needs and testing of what's going on. So first of all, I think we have to really look to the state and, uh, and our own guidance. And what that shows us is, is that uh, there's cert three certain criteria that have to be met, three areas. One is epidemiology, which is our number of tests are increasing and our number of results are de decreasing. That's a very flatline way to say it, but that's disease spread and identification. Number two is the healthcare network, which is another criteria area. And that's, do we have the surge capacity to be able to take an influx? And we do have that at this point. And we do have PPE and uh, personal protective uh, equipment for the healthcare providers. Third is public health, uh, which is the public health system. Do we have the right uh, facial coverings policies? Do we have um, the other kind of system set up so that uh, there's hygiene at uh, businesses and other things like that. So I'd say we're really good on the latter two, healthcare and public health. Um, epidemiology is really dependent upon us rapidly increasing the amount of COVID positive testing and then getting in what we've requested is the, um, uh, the tests for the antibodies that have been approved. There's three tests approved by FDA. Now, a lot of people are, of course, eager to get back into our parks. So there's a couple of questions here. And maybe I'll ask them both and you can respond. Number one, when will we be able to use the hiking and biking trails in Sonoma County? And two, I noticed that golfers seem to be out there on the golf course. So why aren't the parks open and why can't the rest of us use the parks? Well, I'll start with your latter question, which is that currently golf courses are not allowed. They're not an essential business. So if that's happening, then somebody needs to uh, make sure they follow up and, uh, and do a compliance check. Um, but on the other side, with parks and, let's say, private recreation like golf and um, other kind of things, what we need to do is, is that is a top priority for the Board of Supervisors. I know we're having a conversation in our board meeting tomorrow and later this week about this exact item. The goal for parks, our parks director, Bert Whitaker, was uh, we had such a horrible problem with non-compliance in those first couple weeks of COVID that they had to shut it down because they weren't able to manage it. But to take that time in between then and now to say, this is how we would do a soft opening. And now that we don't have the same kind of visitorship from uh, the Bay Area and other places coming to go after the beaches because they don't have uh, anything available to them, how do we manage this for locals first? Uh, and focus on it. So I'm looking forward to getting a report from Burt Whitaker. Um, for me, I would hope that we are uh, opening up, soft opening of parks and other recreation in the next week or two weeks. Okay, now let me ask uh, just a couple of other questions and these are about business. So the first one is, uh, I was wondering if Sonoma County will extend the date to which Airbnbs shall remain unrentable to be safe from guests who may be affected. I think there's a lot of concern 
you know, we're a, a tourist area that people might be coming from areas and bringing uh, the coronavirus to our area once, even once our curve has been flattened. Well, uh, bingo. Case in point, you're, you're talking about the same thing that we're discussing right now and that we're discussing with our health officer. Because at this point, even though there's, you know, today people protesting at the state capitol without masks saying that we've all overreacted and this is not a problem, um, the reality is, is that what we see in the health world is that there is still spread there. The more testing we do, the more cases we find. Uh, the majority of the cases initially that were all travel related have all become community spread cases and close contacts with those who traveled even back then. And so we don't have the numbers still in line to be able to, uh, to be able to allow basically everything to ease and smooth in the ways that we want it to. So um, I understand the concern. I understand the, uh, uh, the, the issues that are out there, but uh, uh, we're going to be going through with our, with our health officer, not just what we need to do to reopen, but what we need to do to fully reopen. And um, I think that's a valid, huge comment is let's open up for our community, our residents, and have that be the priority. And then let's open up for the world when we can. Okay, and then there's just the, the poignant questions about people who have all sorts of businesses in our county. I'm sure you're hearing from them every single day. Here, here's an example. Is there a plan to allow small businesses to open with social distancing? Specifically, how about pet grooming? Do, do, is there a timeline for how we can get some of these small businesses, which are the lifeblood of our community, open? So the first thing is, is um, I couldn't agree more. I mean, um, what we're hearing from our neighbors and uh, friends, you know, uh, I'm not just an elected official. I'm my own, I'm my own constituent in my community. You know, it's like um, it kills me that Walmart is open for groceries, but then you can also buy items in Walmart that you could buy at a small business, but it's not open because it's not an essential business. So there's this loophole that you sell an essential item and then you can sell all these other things. Um, that's not what Sonoma County is all about. So this is another item that's going to be brought up uh, tomorrow during our board meeting and this week intensely. I think the three big things for me um, as we look at the current shelter in place order and where we go from here is number one is where are we at with uh, our parks and our open spaces so that people can get out and not go crazy uh, and not go uh, get cabin fever, you know, like we already have. Number two is, is that there's a lot of issues around the construction world and uh, details on you can only build a house if it's 10% inclusionary housing and others. We took some of those policies from the Bay Area. Those are very specific policies, not risk-based policies. And we wanna see uh, movement on those as well. Number three is exactly what you just referred to, which is small businesses being able to get back going and thrive. If Walmart can put uh, tape on the ground that says on this aisle you go this way, on this one you go that way, and they can manage it. Um, obviously, we want to support that. The difficulty is, is, is that we cannot go below the state order. So the state order specifically says that things like pet grooming and others are not essential services. So if they're not selling an essential item, then, 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 then it's a non-starter, right? So um, that's, where, that's where it's important that we keep up with the state. Okay, James Gore, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you so much. God bless everybody out there. Stay safe, stay vigilant, uh, realize it's still an important time, but uh, let's move from modeling to data, get that testing up and uh, uh, get things rolling. In the South Bay, a nonprofit startup news organization has been reporting on issues important to San Jose residents and businesses. Pamela Lawrence sat down with senior reporter Janice Bitters of San Jose Spotlight to talk about some recent stories she's written on the coronavirus pandemic. So Gavin Newsom often refers to California as the nation, as a nation state. And he's really taken the lead on um, being one of the first governors to go public with announcing a plan to reopen his state. Um, and he says it's going to be a plan based on science and health data. So you reported on his plan. Would you tell me a little bit about what you learned and who he's taking direction from? Yeah, so Governor Newsom, 
you know, he very much stressed that he's not going to be swayed by political pressures to reopen the economy early. Um, he's going to be swayed by medical experts as well as data. And what he's really looking for are two weeks where the um, number of infections and specifically the number of hospitalizations, especially, have stabilized and even started to go down. So he wants to see, my understanding is a two week period where we're not seeing gains. And in fact, we're starting to see a trend downward before he lifts those orders. So that's at least one of the data points, but he's also trying to meet several several milestones before he makes that decision. So he wants to put specific um, backstops in place. Here, if X, Y, Z happens, we're gonna go back to shelter in place. And so they wanna set those kinds of parameters in advance. They are also looking to make sure that, you know, they, they're gonna do projections. If we let people go back, loosen the rules a little bit and let some of them go back to work, what are our projections about where, where the infection rate is gonna be? And do we have the resources in our hospitals to meet the potential need there? They don't want to have to go into a crisis care situation. They want to be, make sure that they've got enough ventilators, they've got enough PPE and medical staff. Let's talk for a minute about the recently announced advisory council that um, that San Jose Mayor um, Sam Licardo announced for economic recovery. Yeah, definitely. So, and it's so funny because the day after Lucardo announced that, um, Newsom got on the air and talked about his own economic council. So everybody seems to be pretty lockstep. But um, so Lucardo's is, he basically is going to have a 30-person economic recovery council. They will be an advisory board. They're not going to be voting and making decisions that, you know, will, they're not the decision makers for how people's lives will change. But they're, it's going to be made up of people from all different sectors of the business world. There will be no elected leaders on this council. He was very clear about that, that this is an advisory counter council made up of the people who make jobs happen. When we think about economic recovery, there's more to it than just getting people back to work. There are other um, you know, other avenues to look at, and this is the homeless issue and, um, you know, other things that make up financial well-being. You know, th this all plays a part because, um, you know, if, if only a few of the people in the community are doing well, that doesn't make a great economy. <laughs> we need right. everybody to feel comfortable and spend their money and things like that. So they're going to be addressing, I think their goal is that they want to the way that they're saying it is they actually want to create a better Silicon Valley. They're, they're framing this as a very optimistic situation where they can not only bring back many of the jobs, but also maybe create better equity in the meantime through new systems. This sort of leads me to wonder then about another vulnerable population in San Jose, but of course throughout California, throughout the country, but specifically San Jose. I know you recently reported on um, a plan in place for undocumented immigrants who make up a very essential part of our workforce here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they, they really do. Und undocumented in immigrants um, are often the people that are paid the least. They are our grocery store workers. They're the people in the manufacturing um, spaces. They're the people that are bringing us our food. So they're oft often getting paid the least. And right now, many of them are considered essential employ employees. And that means that they're paying in tax, but they don't qualify for unemployment if they've lost their job. And they don't qualify for the federal stimulus um, that so many of us got. And so uh, in San Jose, they haven't rolled out a specific plan to address that, but Governor Gavin Newsom did say that he, as well as several philanthropic partners, are going to come together and create a $125 million fund where they will um, allow undocumented people to apply to get some money. It would be up to $500 for an individual or $1,000 for a family slash household. Um, and they just have to show that they've been negatively affected by the coronavirus. That was our South Bay correspondent, Pamela Lawrence, and she'll be bringing us an update from the South Bay weekly during our coronavirus town hall on Tuesday. And if not Pamela, then we'll have another update from the South Bay, but we definitely want to make sure that you're getting a good picture of the Bay Area during this time. So next up, we're going to talk about KBBS town hall. We have an update from what happened today. 
Every week on Tuesday, they also do a town hall. Um, it's in Spanish on their radio station. This week, they talked about um, testing in Sonoma County, and Melissa Valle, who is a communications coordinator with Sonoma County, talked about the homeless population, and she said that as of yet, we have not seen any positive tests come from the homeless population, which is good news, of course. That's a vulnerable community, and we don't want to see spreading in that community, so the county has been um, testing some individuals to see what is happening there. Um, she also talked about the need for facial covering. So the county is now accepting donations of homemade facial coverings. So if you are a seamstress and you're able to sew one, um, you can do so and donate those facial coverings to the Salvation Army. Um, now that is their location on Stony Point Road. However, should you um, have a facial covering that you can donate, please make sure that you are washing the materials you use to make that um, before you make the mask and then also wash the mask after prior to donating. Um, again, you can bring those to Salvation Army on Stony Point Road. Again, um, KBBF's town halls in Spanish on 89.1 on Tuesdays from 5 to 6 p.m. And we also are simulcasting in Spanish on La Mejor Radio 104.1. And we'll be bringing you the highlights from their town hall weekly during ours. Um, and you can also listen live on their radio station. So Darren will tell you how to submit your viewer questions for our town hall next week. Back to you, Darren. Thanks, Adia. And thank you for joining us for Coronavirus, What You Need to Know. Remember, these live town hall specials are broadcast each Tuesday evening starting at 7 p.m. and air on KRCB-TV, KPJK-TV, with radio simulcast on KRCB-FM Radio 91 and Spanish language live translation on La Mejor Radio 104.1 FM. The programs are also live streamed on Facebook Live, YouTube, and at norcalpublicmedia.org. Now, remember to share your questions for our next program by using our contact form at norcalpublicmedia.org slash coronavirus. The contact form is displayed on every page of the website dealing with the corona pandemic in our region. On that page, you'll also find the Frequently Asked Questions section, where answers to many of your questions may already be shared. Now, we've done many radio reports and TV spots on coronavirus um, information for our community, and those can also all be found on the website at norcalpublicmedia.org. Click on coronavirus or go to norcalpublicmedia.org slash coronavirus to learn more. All the information that you need in one place. We hold these programs so that the community can remain together during this difficult time. I hope that you'll stay with us and keep tuned in to NorCal Public Media for the latest coronavirus news. Thanks for joining us. I'm Darren Lachelle with Adia White for NorCal Public Media.